good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our grand rounds for the SSD Complex GI Surgery Fellows uh, for April. We have a great talk today on a very cool topic. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Benner Bennett as our moderator this evening. He's Assistant Professor of Surgery, as well as the Assistant Program Director of the General Surgery Residency and then Director of Colon and Rectal Surgery at the University of South Florida Marsani College of Medicine, as well as Vice Chief of General Surgery at Tampa General. Dr. Bennett, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing our fellow and just giving us a bird's eye view of the topic for tonight. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> and just a, to, uh, a little bit of a correction, not the director of colorectal surgery, just research within our division. So um, hope to one day be director of the division, but uh, we'll see. Still have a, a well-respected colleague ahead of me who uh, has, despite his age, has no plans of retiring soon. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity to, to moderate this session. Uh, and uh, tonight we, we have the pleasure of hearing uh, Dr. Dylan Morris, who uh, is an advanced, uh, minimally invasive and advanced GI surgery fellow at St. Joseph Medical Center, uh, present on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, uh, basically applications of endocyanin and green uh, in, in surgery and various different types of surgery. Uh, so kind of broadly termed, we could call it fluorescence guided uh, surgery. And there's a lot of different applications for this. It's something that I've championed at our medical center and find myself constantly standing up at M&M to, uh, to discuss with, uh, with our faculty and our trainees about whether it was done, why or why it wasn't done and, and what the benefits of it are. So um, I'm very excited to hear Dr. Morris uh, talk to us more about this and, uh, and then hopefully uh, lend some insight from my own practice and experience. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, so again, uh, my name is Dylan Morris. I'm the Minimally Invasive and Advanced Gastrointestinal Fellow at St. Joseph Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Society for the Surgery of Elementary Tract for giving me the opportunity to present to you all today. Uh, additionally, I'd like to thank my program director, Dr. Eugene Cho, for providing me with an in-depth exposure to this versatile technology uh, that I'll be discussing today here at my Grand Rounds. Um, so today I'll be discussing applications of endocyanin green and near infrared fluorescence imaging in minimally invasive and general surgery. Uh, additionally, I'll be discussing applications of ICG within the context of general surgery more broadly. Uh, so in summary, who says it's not easy being green? I'll explain why it is. Um, get my slides moving here. I have no disclosures. The objectives of my talk today will include the following, an introduction and description of ICG, an outline of fluorescence imaging technology. Uh, then I will discuss multiple <laughs> clinical applications of ICG and near-infrared fluorescence imaging technology and minimally invasive and general surgery. And finally, we'll talk about some limitations of the technology, as well as potential future applications and areas for further research and development. A famous anthropomorphic frog named Kermit once said, it's not easy being green. Kermit was wrong. The goal of my talk today is to convince you all that it is indeed easy to be green. First, I would like to offer some background on the history and properties of ICG. ICG was first approved by the FDA for clinical use in 1956. To date, it is the only fluorescent substance that is approved for use in humans in the context of clinical practice. Laparoscopic fluorescence imaging technologies were first developed in 2010, allowing for more versatile uh, versatility with regards to the application of this technology. Indocyanin green, or ICG, is an amphiphilic tricarbocyanin iodide dye. When used intravascularly, ICG binds to plasma proteins. Approximately 98% of injected ICG will bind to plasma proteins, while the remaining 2% is free in serum. This results in confinement of ICG within the intravascular space until it is taken up by hepatocytes and subsequently excreted into bile. ICG has a half-life of approximately three to five minutes. Following intravascular injection of ICG, it can be visualized in arteries and veins in as little as one minute. ICG undergoes hepatic clearance. The rate limiting step of ICG clearance from the body is hepatocyte uptake of the compound. Though once this occurs, ICG is cleared quite qu quickly with a hepatocyte clearance rate of 18 to 24% per minute. 
Additionally, it should be noted that there is no enterohepatic recirculation associated with ICG. This relatively rapid rate of clearance, particularly when compared with analogous substrates, confers a significant advantage in that it allows for the use of multiple injections over the course of a single procedure. ICG is virtually non-toxic and therefore demonstrates a very favorable safety profile. The LD50 of ICG is 50 to 80 milligrams per kilogram, which vastly exceeds the standard doses of less than two milligrams per kilogram that are used in the context of procedural interventions that we will be discussing today. ICG has very few side effects, most of which are quite mild and infrequently observed. The incidence of adverse effects is approximately one in 42,000 patients. These include mild effects such as nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, and re reactive leukocytoses. Although anaphylactic reactions associated with ICG have been reported, these two are extremely rare, with an incidence of 0.003%. The risk of anaphylactic reactions, although rare, does appear to correlate with higher doses of ICG, oftentimes exceeding 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Aside from this very rare incidence of anaphylactic reactions, it should be noted that there have been no additional documented life-threatening side effects associated with this compound. Contraindications to ICG include allergies to iodine and hyperthyroidism. Pregnancy has also been cited as a contraindication to the use of ICG as it has not been well studied and it is unknown as to whether or not there are any associated teratogenic effects. Fluorescence is a form of luminescence in which a substance absorbs light or other electromagnetic radiation and then subsequently emits this absorbed light at a longer wavelength. The electromagnetic spectrum is demonstrated here. Now, there are multiple objects that fall along the electromagnetic spectrum. For instance, gamma radiation is responsible for production of our angry green friend, the Incredible Hulk. The visible light spectrum is responsible for the aforementioned liar, Kermit the Frog. And finally, the near infrared spectrum is responsible for the images demonstrated by the technology that we're discussing here today, ICG. ICG demonstrates excitation with light and light absorption at a wavelength of approximately 750 to 800 nanometers. When exposed to near infrared, ICG re-emits light or fluoresces with a maximum peak of approximately 830 nanometers. The photo on the bottom of the screen provides an excellent demonstration of how our current imaging technology is able to take advantage of this immunofluorescence. In this case, the robotic firefly system is shown. The scope emits an excitation laser light force, causing the ICG compound to fluoresce. The fluorescence uh, at longer wavelength is then picked up by the imaging system and subsequently presented to the operating surgeon on a monitor. There are a variety of different platforms that have capabilities for fluorescence imaging with ICG. The technology available encompasses a gamut of multiple different surgical approaches with platforms catering to open, laparoscopic, and robotic surgery. While the purpose of my talk today is to discuss the applications of ICG and near-infrared fluorescence imaging and not to provide any explicit endorsement of any particular company's technology per se, I have included examples within this presentation of the technologies that I have had the pleasure of using and becoming familiar with throughout the course of my fellowship. The image on the left demonstrates the Stryker laparoscopic tower, more specifically the 1688 platform, which utilizes fluorescence imaging technology in the context of its broader laparoscopic functions. The middle image shows the Stryker SPY portable handheld imaging system, or SPY-FI, uh, which is used for fluorescence imaging in the setting of open surgery, and finally, the image on the right shows the intuitive DaVinci XI platform, which has Firefly imaging capabilities, allowing for ICG-based fluorescence imaging during robotic surgery. Fluorescence imaging technology platforms oftentimes offer a multitude of different visualization modes, each with associated pros and cons. Overlay mode is a visualization setting that provides the white light image with subsequent overlay of ICG near infrared fluorescence imaging. 
This mode allows for visualization of the fluorescence, in this case, fluorescence of the biliary system and liver parenchyma, while also maintaining the context of standard white light anatomic landmarks. Contrast mode presents a grayscale. Yes. Sorry, can I interrupt you for just a second to make a comment yes. and ask a question? So I think it's important. So that I think this is a great uh, initial background in terms of how endocyanin green works. Why does it allow us to see these uh, structures illuminated uh, fluorescently? Um, <clears throat> I think what's important to understand is all of these uh, different modalities for visualizing the endocyanin green that you've just highlighted um, <clears throat> work by shining that near infrared light at the structure. And if endocyanin green is present there, you're gonna see it fluoresce. So understanding the properties of fluorescence, it, I think it's important to understand just about everything um, will auto fluoresce if excited by the right wavelength of light. So um, fortunately in this case, human tissue does not auto fluoresce when excited by near or when exposed to near infrared light. So when you shine the near infrared light with any one of these modalities at the tissue, if it fluoresces, you can feel confident that you're seeing endocyanin green and whether that's <clears throat> as you'll get to in, in the setting of colorectal anastomosis injection intravenously, you can feel fairly confident that something injected peripherally has made it to, to the tissue that you're observing and want to use as your anastomosis. So I think it's just important to understand that when you shine light of certain wavelengths at various different things, including human tissue, if it's the right wavelength of light, that tissue will fluoresce. In this case, though, if you're using one of these uh, technologies, that near infrared, near infrared wavelength of light will not cause human tissue to fluoresce unless there is a fluorophore, a fluorescent substance that does actually get excited and emit uh, 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 fluorescent light um, or fluorescence at that wavelength. Correct. Yeah, it all has to do with that excitation spectrum uh, of the light that's being um, uh, uh, associated with that uh, fluoro fluorophore. So in this case, uh, as mentioned with the ICG, that excitation spectrum is approximately 750 uh, to 800 uh, nanometers on the uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Uh, thank you. Um, I just I think it's important for for all of us to. Uh, I have a colleague, uh, Dr. Volanovic, actually, who um, is very prominent within SSAT. He, he always makes the comment that, and he likes to ask questions at our M&M conference about how the tools that we use work. And I think it's really important. He always highlights how important it is for us to understand how the tools that we're using work so that we can use them appropriately. If you don't know how they work and you're just using a ligature or a bovi or whatever it might be, and you don't understand how it works, you, you could be prone to making mistakes with it. So just like in this setting, I think it's just important to understand how it works. You clearly do, but I want to highlight that for the listener. 100% agree. Thank you. Um, so uh, additional visualization modes afforded by uh, ICG or contrast mode, uh, which presents a grayscale image where ICG fluorescence appears as white, uh, while all other areas of the image appear dark. Uh, this image provides a high level of contrast between fluorescent and non-fluorescent tissue, uh, making it ideal for utilization in the context of perfusion assessments. Another frequently observed uh, mode in fluorescent imaging technology is the ENV mode, uh, which also presents a grayscale image. In contrast to contrast mode, ICG fluorescent tissue appears as green, while all non-fluorescent tissue appears dark. This is the imaging mode that many of you are probably most familiar with when using the Firefly technology available on the DaVinci XI platform. All right, now that we have reviewed some background on ICG and fluorescent imaging technology, it's time to get some, to some more of the exciting stuff, clinical applications. Clinical applications of ICG and near infrared fluorescence technology encompass a vast spectrum across multiple different specialties. Furthermore, as the technology becomes more widespread, clinicians are actively identifying new applications of this versatile technology. For the purpose of my talk, I've opted to hone in on a few particular areas of interest that I felt were particularly relevant and applicable in the context of minimally invasive and general surgery. 
The first application we will be discussing today is the utilization of ICG and near-infrared fluorescence imaging to delineate biliary anatomy in the context of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Gallstone disease affects approximately 10 to 15% of the population. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy, first performed in 1985, has become the gold standard for treatment of gallbladder disease with approximately 90% of cholecystectomies being performed laparoscopically. Today, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is one of the most common elective general surgery procedures performed with nearly 600 to 900,000 of these done annually in the United States. Bile duct injury remains a rare but serious complication of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Literature notes that 4% of patients who sustain a bile duct injury have premature mortality that can be directly attributable to this injury. Although variable percentages are reported in the literature, the incidence ranges from 0.3 to 1.6% and can be even higher in the setting of a difficult gallbladder. The most frequently reported cause of bile duct injury is an error in identification of biliary anatomy. Additionally, in the setting of a difficult gallbladder, inflammatory changes and intra-abdominal adhesions can complicate efforts to define biliary anatomy and close triangle, thereby increasing risk. A critical strategy to lower the risk of bile duct injury involves adequate dissection of close triangle to achieve the critical view of safety, as originally described by Strasburg in 1995. In addition to the critical view of safety, a variety of other techniques to reduce the incidence of bile duct injury have been described. These include fundus-first approaches, subtotal fenestrating and reconstituting cholecystectomy, and a variety of imaging techniques such as intraoperative cholangiography, ultrasound, and near-infrared fluorescence imaging. Although there is no robust evidence uh, supporting the routine use of intraoperative cholangiogram to prevent bile duct injury, 2010 guidelines from stages state that the IOC may reduce the rate and severity of bile duct injury and improve injury recognition based on level two and grade B evidence. At this time, IOC remains the gold standard imaging method to delineate biliary anatomy intraoperatively. That being said, IOC does carry a number of disadvantages, including radiation exposure, requirement for specialized technicians and equipment, cost, learning curve, prolonged operative times, and the need to perform a ductotomy and intubate the cystic duct, potentially increasing the risk of bile duct, bile duct injury in the event that biliary anatomy is misidentified. The ideal imaging technique would ideally ameliorate these disadvantages as described above. Enter ICG and near-infrared fluorescence imaging. The use of ICG fluorescence cholangiography in the setting of laparoscopic cholecystectomy was first described by Dr. Ishizawa in 2009. When injected intravenously, ICG reaches peak concentration in the bile between 30 minutes and two hours after injection. There are distinct benefits to ICG when compared with intraoperative traditional cholangiography and standard white light laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Additionally, the literature has described direct injection of ICG into the gallbladder intraoperatively. This modality is extremely dynamic, allowing for visualization of target structures before, during, and after dissection from adjacent tissues. ICG avoids the need for incision and cannulation of the biliary tract in order to uh, identify anatomy. The use of ICG in near-infrared fluorescence imaging does not require exposure to radiation or a specialized technician. Multiple studies have demonstrated that the visualization of vital biliary structures with ICG fluorescence imaging was significantly faster when compared with traditional IOC and white light laparoscopy, and thus total operative times are decreased. The use of fluorescence angiography compared with IOC is also associated with a significant decrease in median cost of cholecystectomy. Other benefits include improved patient outcomes, particularly in the setting of a difficult gallbladder. Additionally, there are some preliminary evidence that fluorescence cholangiography may contribute to a decreased incidence of bile duct injury, something that I'll be discussing in more detail later on. 
A multitude of studies have demonstrated that the use of ICG to visualize critical structures in the setting of laparoscopic cholecystectomy is, at the very least, non-inferior to traditional intraoperative cholangiography. When coupled with the additional advantages as described above, ICG presents itself as a very attractive modality for the use in setting of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. A meta-analysis by Lim and colleagues compared the efficacy of fluorescence cholangiography with traditional IOC and delineating extrahepatic biliary anatomy. Of the studies they reviewed, visualization rates of vital structures, including the cystic duct, common bile duct, cystic duct CBD junction, were higher with fluorescence cholangiography when compared with IOC and approached statistical significance. The review also found that visualization rates of the common hepatic duct were significantly higher uh, with fluorescence cholangiography. In addition to this, Lim and colleagues reported that the technical feasibility of performing fluorescence cholangiography was significantly favorable when compared with traditional IOC. In multiple studies reviewed, IOC was aborted due to technical reasons such as difficulty with intubation of the cystic duct or lack of specialized imaging equipment. Uh, as you can see here from their study, IOC was unsuccessful in nearly 17% of patients, whereas compared with ICG fluorescence, it was successful and unsuccessful in only 1.5% of patients. These advantages were further underscored by Lai and colleagues, whose review demonstrated that pre-dissection detection rates of vital biliary structures was significantly higher with ICG. I'm certain that we have all had the pleasure of taking a patient to the operating room and upon entering the abdomen, encountering a gallbladder that looked like this. While I can't speak for everybody in the room, speaking personally, I know that seeing a gallbladder like this can cause me a significant amount of dismay as I know that I'm in for a tough case. Fortunately, many of the advantages of fluorescence cholangiography compared with white light laparoscopy are underscored when applied in the setting of cases with increased surgical difficulty. Zhu and colleagues found that in cases of difficult gallbladder, when compared with white light laparoscopy, fluorescence cholangiography was associated with significant decreases in operative time, blood loss, length of stay, need for drain placements, and adverse reactions. In this study, cases were classified as difficult according to the following criteria. Intraoperative or pathologic findings confirming separation, gangrene, or perforation, poorly visualized hepatocystic triangle, variations in biliary anatomy, gallbladder atrophy, or cases done in the setting of gallstone pancreatitis. In the context of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, there are some notable limitations associated with the use of ICG and near-infrared fluorescence imaging. At this point in time, there is still no consensus on optimal dosing and timing of ICG injection prior to lap coli. Aranda and colleagues performed a prospective study of 146 patients undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy with intravenous ICG to better delineate the optimal dosing and timing of ICG for the purpose of fluorescence cholangiography. Patients were divided into three groups based on timing of administration, 20 to 30 minutes before surgery, two to six hours before surgery, and the day before surgery. Patients were also divided into two groups based on dosing, with one group receiving a fixed dose of 2.5 milligrams, and the other receiving a weight-based dosing of 0.05 kilograms per, or milligrams per kilogram. When comparing groups based on timing of IV administration, visualization of the common bile duct was achieved in 82.9% of those who received ICG 20 to 30 minutes before surgery, 97.1% for those who uh, in the two to six hour group, and only 65.5% in those who received ICG the day before. This finding was determined to be statistically significant. There were no statistically significant differences in visualization of the cystic duct in either of these three groups. When evaluating groups based on dosing of ICG, regardless of time of administration, ICG administered in a fixed dose of 2.5 milligrams were found to have significantly improved visualization of the common bile duct when compared with those who received weight-based dosing. In conclusion, 
Aranda and colleagues recommended an optimal dose and timing of 2.5 milligrams of ICG administered intravenously two to six hours before the procedure. With that being said, they did note that ICG administered 30 minutes prior to surgery did allow for sufficient and adequate visualization of biliary anatomy. There are some additional limitations and areas of improvement associated with fluorescence cholangiography. The signal to background enhancement ratio and ability to identify biliary anatomy can be diminished in the setting of simultaneous liver parenchymal enhancement. As the timing and dosage of ICG is further refined, this will ideally be corrected. Appropriately delineating the correct timing and dosage of ICG is further confounded in the setting of patients with poor liver function, such as cirrhosis, as these patients take longer to extract ICG from the blood and subsequently excrete it into bile. The sensitivity of near-infrared fluorescence imaging is also affected by tissue thickness due to limitations in tissue penetrance of ICG fluorescence. This may limit efficacy of this modality in the setting of severe inflammation and edema for the surrounding tissue, or in patients with high BMI and significant amounts of visceral adiposity. Furthermore, it should be noted that there are disparate results in the literature as to whether or not obesity is a limiting factor in visualization of biliary anatomy due to limitations in tissue penetrance. Although theoretically, the penetrance of fluorescent visualization is one centimeter or less, studies evaluating the efficacy of fluorescence cholangiography has demonstrated mixed results with biliary structure visualization in patients with high BMIs. Some series have shown decreased visualization, while others have shown no difference. Surprisingly, Aranda and colleagues found improved biliary visualization in patients with BMIs greater than 25, when compared with those who have BMIs less than 25. That being said, although visualization of structures may potentially be limited in this setting, as dissection proceeds, the adequacy of visualization improves, all while still avoiding incision and cannulation of the biliary tract to appropriately visualize anatomy, which is required with traditional IOC. At this point too, Fluorescence cholangiography has not been shown to be able to effectively identify common bile duct stones and to therefore not be used as a substitute to traditional IOC in cases of cholelithiasis. It is difficult to discern whether or not fluorescence cholangiography contributes to a reduced incidence of bile duct injury, as there are currently no studies that are adequately powered to detect bile duct injury as a primary outcome measure. This can be attributed to the fact that while serious, fortunately bile duct injury is overall an infrequent complication of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Given this, a study designed to detect a difference in bile duct injury when comparing fluorescence cholangiography with white light laparoscopy would require a large number of patients in each treatment arm. For example, if we assume a 0.4% incidence of bile duct injury, a study designed to detect a 50% decrease in injury rate with 95% confidence and 80% power would require nearly 12,000 patients per treatment arm. As there are currently no studies to date that have come anywhere close to enrolling the required 24,000 patients uh, to statistically uh, detect a statistically significant reduced rate in bile duct injury with fluorescence crangiography, Dip and colleagues attempted to generate rate estimates for bile duct injury using cumulative data extracted from previously published studies. The results of the meta-analysis demonstrated that weighted rate of bile duct injury was lower when fluorescence cholangiography was used. Although these results should be considered preliminary and inferential in nature, it does provide some promising data and although further study is required uh, to more definitively discern whether or not fluorescence cholangiography does indeed provide an advantage with regards to lowering the incidence of bile duct injury. In summary, fluorescence cholangiography and laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a promising technology with a multitude of benefits when compared with traditional intraoperative cholangiography and white light laparoscopy. Although there are some limitations to the, te the technology, I believe that it represents an exceptionally beneficial tool to general surgeons to enhance care of their patients. Uh, and who doesn't like these cool videos? Good, Dylan. I'll just add a couple of things here <clears throat> real quickly. Yes. 
The reason the Strasbourg recommendation is for a critical view establishment is because just routine cladography alone has not been shown to decrease the injury rate. All it does is decrease the interval until detection of the injury. And the reason for that, when and you look back on our perspective analysis, one of the big reasons for that is that we as surgeons are not good at reading cholangiography. So the most common thing, I, as I recall, that was misread was misidentifying the right hepatic duct as the cystic duct. And if obviously, if you make that error and you flip that, you've already got a major ductal injury. So um, part and partial of this, whether you're using um, intraoperative cholangiography or ICG, should be education on how to read these. Because it's not that every, uh, every case you look at isn't quite as clear cut when you see the imaging here. And it's those outlier cases, because as you know, a very large percentage of biliary anatomy is, is aberrant, is not, is not, does not conform to textbook descriptions. And the more training we have and that we offer on that and how to interpret these, I think that goes hand in hand with the availability of the technology. Agree. Uh, I want to echo some of those comments uh, and, and ask a couple of questions of Dr. Morris. So one of my questions that I wrote down is, you know, even when using ICG cholangiography, what's critical when doing these uh, these cholecystectomies? It's been a long time since I've done a cholecystectomy, and I'm thankful for that. But um, because of some of these images you've shown, uh, but you know, what's absolutely critical, uh, even if you're going to use ICG cholangiography here? So I, I think to um, you know echo Dr. Cho's point as well. Uh, you know ICG should not stand as a substitute for establishing the critical view of safety uh, as as described by Strasburg. I think if anything, it's uh, it, it's just an augmentation to the safety of your surgical approach. Um, but I, I I don't think that somebody should fall into the logical trap that it should uh, uh, potentially um, substitute for that safe and adequate dissection. Um, you know, in, in my mind. Uh, my, my viewpoint is that, um, you know, I, ICG will stand as a substitute to, to more standard cholangiography in that it, it avoids some of the pitfalls that are associated with cholangi uh, uh, traditional intraoperative cholangiography. Um, you know, as Dr. Cho notes, um, you know, oftentimes there is a variety of uh, aberrant anatomy in the setting of cholecystectomy. Uh, and, and as I stated previously, the, the most frequent reason for bile duct injury is misidentification of anatomy. So in order to perform a, a standard IOC, um, you have to clip a duct. And in general, we try our best to delineate and define that as the cystic duct. Um, but once that duct is clipped, the injury has occurred. Um, so I, I think, you know, the benefit of ICG is that it allows dynamic visualization of that anatomy throughout the course of the procedure and avoids some of those pitfalls associated with traditional IOC. Well, in fairness, you don't have to clip a duct to do a cholangiogram. You can do a transcystic, sorry, transgallbladder cholangiogram. That's a so-called Kumar catheter. There are technologies that will do that, but, um, that involves putting a hole somewhere, somewhere. So it's not, it's not essential to put a hole in a duct to do a cholangiogram, but that is how most people do it. Looks like Dr. Jariah has a hand up there. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment as somebody who unfortunately gets a large number of bile duct injuries sent my way. So, you know, everyone states that they've seen the critical view and that they clipped one structure going to the liver. The problem is it looks this critical view, what you're pointing out as a cystic duct could be the common duct and the common hepatic duct could be up in as it dives back towards the liver. That's a classic injury for, for a common bile duct uh, injury. It's actually a common bile duct resection, right? That's a classic injury. So I'm sort of, being an HPB surgeon, and Dr. Benzi can tell you this, it's sort of one of these crazy things where I actually want to see the common hepatic duct, either by uh, ICG or whatever modality you're using. And I do think, I just want to echo Dr. Cho's point that a, a normal cholangiogram needs to take, um, needs to have distal flow, intrahepatic at least right-sided flow, a cystic duct and no missing segment in between and filling of the duodenum. There are four components to that. So you've got to be able to read that cholangiogram normal. Every bile duct injury I get is sent to me with a distal bile duct filling only and they call it a normal cholangiogram. The last thing I, I just want to say for lap coli is, I always make our trainees lift up that left lobe of the liver and see where the hepatic artery is. Because if you're dissecting the hepatic artery, you're too close. So I want to see the hepatic artery. I know it scares everyone, but in standard formation, you should be miles away from the hepatic artery. The easiest plane to dissect is between the common 
bile duct and the hepatic artery. And when we get these bile duct injuries, I actually want to learn about how to do a portal dissection laparoscopically because it's so beautiful. Uh, because that is the easiest place to dissect when you've got a, go a, a bad gallbladder. I also learned how to do lap coles from Dr. Benzi, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think a lot of these comments come back to the fact, and, and what I was trying to get at is, is what's critical, I think, here, whether you're doing a cholangiogram, a traditional intraoperative cholangiogram, or ICG cholangiography, is you have to understand the biliary anatomy, and you have to understand that there's a lot of aberrant anatomy, and what can those variations of normal or truly aberrant anatomy B so that you can interpret that cholangiography appropriately to then avoid the injury. Um, you know, I think that's the critical part. Nobody, nobody in this situation clips the, the common bile duct uh, or common hepatic duct on purpose, right? They do it because they misinterpreted, as Dr. Cho mentioned, they misinterpreted the cholangiogram or the, the cholangiography here with ICG. So I think that's the critical part. I, I'm curious to, you know, as we move more toward uh, robotics and, and using things like ICG and geography and cholangiography, what the implications are on training. I think, you know, hearing the comments uh, being made by other faculty, it's, it's, um, it's great to hear. I think it's critical that the trainees still learn how to achieve this critical view of safety, see the other structures, describe aberrant anatomy to avoid the injuries. Because I think if you use things like the cholangiography as a crutch and not, as you called it, an augmentation of your normal uh, standard dissection, you're going to get in trouble. So I think it's important to, to understand that. And then one more question for Dr. Morris. I'm piggybacking on some of the comments I saw being made in the chat. What are you gonna do in your practice when you're out on your own without somebody looking over your shoulder? Are you gonna do this for every gallbladder? Are you gonna do it selectively? Are you never gonna do it? What's gonna be your approach? Uh, you know, I think at this point, and I have been thinking about this a lot, uh, you know, I'm gonna opt to do uh, ICG fluorescence with all of my gallbladders. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier in the talk too, uh, you know, I, I don't think the technology nor, nor does, uh, do I think the literature at this point supports the routine use of ICG fluorescence in settings of cholidocolithiasis. And in that case, I'll still tr opt to do traditional IOC. Um, and I, I think that that does also piggyback on your point that, you know, even in light of newly developed technologies, uh, I don't think we can forego uh, learning and practicing those more traditional aspects because, you know, who knows, one day the, you know, the laparoscopic tower is not working and you need to do an IOC. I think it's critical that you have that skill set available to you. I think it's worth pointing out, too, that um, this this aspect of the technology is not at its maturation endpoint yet. Um, there probably is not a lot more you can do as far as perfusion technology with ICG, but for this and subtle node mapping, there is a way to go in terms of software manipulation that will make this a lot more useful. They should be able to come up with software that shows us shadows within the duct and shows us common bile duct stones. The other big problem, like Rohan was saying, I routinely make my trainees lift up that lobe just like he's doing right there to try to identify the proximal common hepatic duct and ideally see the, that hepatic artery pumping away. But one of the things that can happen is the reflection of that perfused liver right down on that soft tissue there can look like there's a there's a linear structure there. That also should be able to be differentiated by software as to whether that's a reflection or that's actually um, or biofluorescence. So there are there's maturation to come with this technology, and I, I think it's going to be a better tech in ten years than it is now. Uh, good afternoon. May I may I comment for two minutes? My name is Juan Sanabria. I am very senior surgeon. We published hundred and seventy common bile duct injuries when I was in Cleveland, and I stood doing some of them here, but we have been able to decrease the common bile duct injuries where I am, uh, the chairman, uh, and we are going to publish our 9,000 cholecystectomies in the last 10 years with a common bile duct injury below 0.01. So uh, we try to change the culture and we use intraoperative cholangiogram. We have seven robots and we use this, but the, the thing that we have changed basically is that we empower in the OR everybody. And we do a slow times in the sense that before you clip a cup, everything, the nurse, the residents, and the faculty has to agree upon the anatomy for sure. Critical view has to be agreeable in everybody. And if somebody has any doubt, they should call somebody senior 
to the OR before clipping. Now, honest to God, this is a very clear anatomy, but most of the gallbladders that we're getting here, the anatomy is far from this easy. When they are very, very inflamed, um, when they are, you know, to 20 years, especially in males that has a lot of big stones, the anatomy could be very, very tricky. And I, I really think that changing the culture to have more people in power to help you out to identify the anatomy to say, hey, listen, it's time for a slowdown. It's time to call a, another couple of eyes before you cut or clip something. Thank you. I agree. I mean, you know, I, I think oftentimes, uh, you know, when I especially when I chat with um, uh, more junior residents, the kind of uh, view cholecystectomies is the, you know, an easy entry level case. And, you know, I, I enter every single cholecystectomy with a, a healthy uh, uh, um, uh, knowledge that it is a very risky case and, and, and the implications of misidentifying anatomy and causing an injury are massive. So, you know, I do think that it really speaks volumes to try and make sure that you have that culture within the OR where everybody should feel comfortable speaking up given the you know, the potential impact of these injuries to patients and providers alike. Excellent. Dr. Morris, you want to just continue with our next topic? I want you to yeah. run out of time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so uh, moving on to breast cancer, I'll now discuss some of the applications and feasibility of ICG fluorescence-guided sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, breast cancer does represent a leading cause of cancer-related death in women aged 40 and younger. Uh, the morbidity and mortality of breast cancer is significantly reduced with early detection, and nodal status remains a critical factor in prognosis and treatment for breast cancer. Historically, axillary lymph node dissection was used to evaluate lymph node status, though it's associated with significant morbidity, including lymphedema, lymphangiosarcoma, pain, vascular injuries, brachial plexus injuries, among a myriad of other notable complications. Sentinel lymph node biopsy has emerged as a viable alternative to axillary lymph node dissection in patients with early stage breast cancer with clinically and radiographically negative axillary nodes. Research also demonstrates that five-year overall survival for patients with negative sentinel lymph node biopsy who do not undergo axillary lymph node dissection is unchanged when compared with those who do undergo axillary dissection, and thus morbidity associated with an axillary dissection can be avoided. Radioisotope technetium-99 was first introduced as a method for sentinel lymph node mapping in 1993. In 1994, blue dye was subsequently introduced as a method for sentinel lymph node biopsy. At this time, the gold standard for identification of sentinel lymph nodes intraoperatively is a dual tracer method using periareolar or peritumoral injection of radioisotope and blue dye. Existing literature has shown that when used in combination, these two materials are superior when, than when either is used alone. The sentinel lymph node detection rate when radiocolloid and blue dye are used in combination is 95 to 97%. Historically, false negative rates for dual tracer radiocolloid and blue dye is 9.8%. These overall detection and false negative rates of dual tracer methods are as currently the accepted standard. ICG fluorescence-guided sentinel lymph node biopsy has emerged as a potentially viable modality for the assessment of nodal status in early-stage breast cancers. ICG fluorescent visualization of lymphatic channels and sentinel lymph node biopsy was first described in 2005. When evaluating the efficacy of ICG, its viability should be compared against combined detection rate and false negative rates of the current dual tracer standard. The performance of ICG fluorescence-guided sentinel lymph node biopsy particularly when compared with more traditional materials, has garnered significant interest. Existing systematic reviews and meta-analyses have demonstrated that overall tumor-positive sentinel lymph node detection rates with ICG are comparable, and in some cases superior to radioisotope methods. That being said, at this time, there are no consensus guidelines for the best protocol regarding, regarding clinical use of ICG fluorescence and sentinel lymph node biopsy and how it may be effectively integrated into more traditional methods. Zhang and colleagues in a meta-analysis published in 2016 sought to evaluate the diagnostic performance of ICG guided sentinel lymph node biopsy. Their analysis yielded a 98% sentinel lymph node detection rate with overall high sensitivity and specificity and a relatively low false negative rate of 8.8%, of 8 which compared uh, to false negative, which was com comparable to false negative values associated with dual tracer standard methods. 
Gnawar Dana and colleagues in a systematic review published in 2020 investigated the detection rate and sensitivity of ICG fluorescence compared with radioisotope in an attempt to better elucidate its clinical applicability. The group evaluated 19 different studies, including over 2,300 patients. Overall, they did not identify any significant difference between ICG and radioisotope for sentinel lymph node detection or sensitivity. Overall rates for ICG ranged from 82 to 100 percent, with those for radioisotope ranging from 85 to 100 percent. The sensitivity, or better stated, the detection rate for tumor-positive sentinel lymph nodes for ICG and radioisotope was also found to be comparable. There was no statistically significant difference in overall detection rates of tumor or tumor-specific detection rates between ICG and radioisotopes. Additionally, false negative rates were not found to be statistically different. Further investigation found that the sensitivity of dual mapping with ICG and radioisotope was significantly better when compared with single agent mapping using either of the two. When dual mapping was used, the sensitivity increased to greater than 91.3%, with false negative rates found to be less than 8.7%, which is comparable in sensitivity and false negative rates when associated with current traditional dual tracer methods. Interestingly, the study also evaluated triple modality mapping with ICG, radioisotope, and blue dye, and found that it conferred no additional benefit when compared with dual tracer using radioisotope and ICG. On the contrary, the inclusion of blue dye decreased the overall detection rate. Reviewers thought that this may be attributable to blue dye absorbing the fluorescent light, thereby interfering with the near-infrared fluorescence imaging. There are numerous advantages associated with the ICG fluorescence-guided sentinel lymph node biopsy. One of the primary advantages of ICG overall is that it offers a rapid transcutaneous visualization in real time. When compared with radioisotopes, ICG is associated with lower cost, lower risk of adverse events, eliminates the need for patients and providers to be exposed to ionizing radiation, Additionally, the use of radioisotope mandates that patients have additional visits to radiology prior to surgery and must receive a preoperative injection prior to entering the operating room. Additionally, the average cost per patient of radioisotope is between $330 and $420, compared with only $5 to $110 for ICG. Although the initial cost of obtaining an operating unit for the purpose of performing fluorescence imaging can be as much as $300,000, this pales in comparison to the cost of developing and maintaining a nuclear medicine facility capable of performing radioisotope injection and mapping. Although the literature I've discussed previously indicates that dual mapping approaches using radioisotope and ICG may confer improved sensitivity and false negative rates, the advantages of ICG as outlined with regards to cost and availability make it an attractive single option. ICG is attractive, an attractive option for hospitals or regional centers that lack sufficient capital to develop and maintain nuclear medicine facilities. This is particularly a prescient issue in more remote areas or emerging countries. Furthermore, shortages and poor sustainability of technetium-99 in the long term highlight the necessity to explore alternative agents, such as ICG, that provide comparable and reproducible results for sentinel lymph node mapping, particularly given the exceptionally important prognostic impact of accurate determination of nodal status in patients with breast cancer. Um, additionally, ICG can be visualized enough to a centimeter through up to a centimeter of tissue, whereas blue dye does not uh, cannot be visualized when there is overlying tissue. It is important to be aware of certain limitations and variables when using ICG fluorescence for sentinel lymph node mapping. As is the case with fluorescence cholangiography and cholecystectomy, optimal dosage, volume, and concentrations of ICG for sentinel lymph node mapping have not been standardized. This is an important area of further research as it has been demonstrated that too high a concentration of ICG can, be an in, can lead to an increased flow to second tier non-sentinel lymph nodes thereby resulting in higher number of nodes being removed and potentially increasing morbidity and risks of lymphedema. Further research is required to determine the optimal ICG concentration and avoid excision of unnecessary nodes. Another notable disadvantage of ICG compared with radioisotope is tissue penetrance. ICG fluorescence can be detected at a tissue depth of no more than one centimeter, 
whereas radioisotopes can be detected in tissues deeper than two centimeters. Given this, one may theorize that detection rates associated with ICG fluorescence may be impacted in patients with higher BMI. Another practical variable to be aware of is the timing of sentinel lymph node biopsy after ICG administration and its effects on operative outcomes. If ICG is injected more than 30 minutes prior to sentinel lymph node biopsy, there's increased likelihood of transit to second tier lymph nodes, thereby potentially increasing the overall number of lymph nodes excised, which can again impact morbidity and overall outcomes. In summary, ICG fluorescent guided sentinel lymph node biopsy for the detection of sentinel uh, lymph node metastases in breast cancer is a viable modality. It performs comparably to radioisotope mapping when used as a single agent, and its benefits are further augmented when used in combination with dual tracer mapping with results comparable to that of current standards. Moving on to our final topic, colorectal surgery. Anastomotic leak in colorectal surgery is reported in anywhere from 3 to 30% of cases. The impact of anastomotic leaks is significant, contributing to increased lengths of stay, morbidity, mortality, increased rates of reoperation, and cost. The mortality associated with anastomotic leak is between 6 and 22%. Furthermore, in the setting of malignancy, it's associated with increased rates of local recurrence, thereby impacting overall cancer-specific and disease-free survival. There are a variety of risk factors for colorectal anastomotic leak, including male gender, tension, distance from the, of the anastomosis from the anal verge, with anastomoses within five centimeters of the anal verge being at highest risk, smoking, advanced age, malnutrition, and preoperative radiation therapy. In addition to this, adequate bowel perfusion is a primary factor associated with the integrity of any colorectal anastomosis. Adequate and reproducible methods of perfusion assessment are crucial to ensure appropriate surgical outcomes and reduce the risk of anastomotic leak. This is particularly critical in the setting of low anterior resection, as anastomotic leaks are increased the closer they are to the anal verge. Additionally, Ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery, although an important component of oncologic resection, does result in hypoperfusion of the left colon, as this segment is now more reliant on collateral perfusion from marginal arcades. Cadaver studies have shown that in up to 20% of individuals, collateral circulation from the marginal artery may be insufficient. Furthermore, in more than 10% of patients undergoing rectosigmoid resections, Marginal artery pressure is decreased by more than 30% after clamping and ligation of the IMA. Given this, it is critical to ensure appropriate perfusion assessment when creating a colorectal anastomosis. Traditional methods for intraoperative perfusion assessment include intestinal color, arterial pulsation, transillumination, colonic peristalsis, and bleeding from the cut edge of the mesentery or staple line. That being said, Intraoperative visual assessment of tissue viability under white light has been shown to underestimate impairments of microvascular perfusion and the incidence of anastomotic leak. For example, one study I reviewed noted that ICG-based fluorescence angiography identified insufficiently perfused tissue in over 16% of cases where perfusion assessment under white light was judged to be adequate further underscoring potential pitfalls of subjective white light evaluation. ICG and fluorescence angiography has emerged as a promising modality to assess intestinal perfusion at the time of bowel anastomosis. Following intravenous injection of ICG, visualization of blood supply with fluorescence angiography may be performed within as little as 30 to 60 seconds. Real-time identification of microvascular anatomy with fluorescence angiography is a critically important tool, particularly in the setting of non-anatomic transections and in situations where vascular anatomy may be altered or impaired. Multiple studies have demonstrated the impact of ICG fluorescence angiography on intraoperative decision-making. Jafari and colleagues evaluated the impact of ICG fluorescence angiography during left-sided colectomy and low anterior resection in a prospective multicenter study. The study included 139 patients undergoing left colectomy and low anterior resection for a variety of clinical indications, including diverticulitis, rectal cancer, and colon cancer. 
Technical feasibility of ICG-based angiography was found to be excellent, with a Jafarian colleagues reporting a 99% success rate of imaging. ICG fluorescence angiography resulted in a change in planned resection margins in 8% of the patients. The overall anastomotic leak rate was also found to be quite low at only 1.4%. Notably, in patients who had a change in surgical plan based on ICG fluorescence angiography, no anastomotic leaks were observed. Sun and colleagues noted similarly impressive results, reporting that their anastomotic leak rate decreased from 10% to less than 2% following the introduction of ICG-based fluorescence angiography at their institution. Chan and colleagues performed a meta-analysis including 20 studies and nearly 5,500 patients to evaluate the impact of ICG-based fluorescence angiography on colorectal anastomotic leak rates. Their review included patients who underwent colorectal resection with and without fluorescence angiography. Anastomotic leak rate for cases in which fluorescence angiography was not used were found to be 8.6% compared with only 3.7% where perfusion assessment was performed with fluorescence angiography. This result was found to be statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.00001, suggesting that ICG-based fluorescence angiography was associated with a statistically significant decrease in rate of anastomotic leak. Further subgroup analysis served to only further reinforce these findings. When evaluating patients who had an anastomotic leak that subsequently required further procedural intervention, Chan and colleagues also found a statistically significant decrease in anastomotic leak rates with fluorescence angiography. This statistically significant decrease in anastomotic leak carried over to subgroup analysis of patients with rectal cancer. Additionally, subgroup analysis of only prospective studies yielded similarly significant results with regards to anastomotic leak rate, which is notable as consideration of prospective studies only serves to reduce the impact of type two errors. Additionally, Chan and colleagues found that ICG led to a change in surgical plan in an anastomotic site in nearly 10% of patients. Despite these very promising findings with ICG fluorescence angiography, there are still some notable limitations that must be addressed. These include the subjective nature of fluorescence angiography, lack of standardized guidelines for dose, timing, and viewing distance, and finally, the impact of venous congestion. Perfusion assessment via ICG-based fluorescence angiography, although superior when compared with subjective assessment under white light, nonetheless remains subjective. For example, in a study by Weta and colleagues, ICG fluorescence angiography resulted in a change in surgical plan 16.1% of the time. Despite this, 22% of patients in this group still developed an anastomotic leak. Although some of these anastomotic leaks could potentially be attributable to perfusion-independent causes, it highlights the inherently subjective nature of ICG-based perfusion assessment in its current use and practice. Uh, given this, recent studies have sought to identify and develop more quantitative and objective standardized metrics by which ICG can be used to assist with perfusion assessment during colorectal surgery. This includes development of fluorescence and intensity time curves from which multiple parameters have been identified uh, as listed here. Of these parameters, Fmax has been identified as a, the most reliable parameter for predicting an astomotic leak. And interestingly, Tmax has demonstrated strong correlation with postoperative recovery of bowel function. In addition to this, researchers also compared small intestine Fmax with colonic Fmask to assist with perfusion assessment. These parameters are promising metrics by which more objective and standardized assessment may be performed to improve accuracy of fluorescence angiography and colon perfusion assessment. And as technology improves, I hope to see real-time calculations integrated into the fluorescence imaging platforms that will provide this kind of data, objective data, intraoperatively, ideally while not forcing me to perform any kind of math in the operating room. Additionally, I don't want to yes. you, but we have a question in our chat. Are leaks usually related to delayed ischemia more so than ischemia at time of surgery, in which case ICG would be limited? And you have about one more minute too. So if you yeah. want to just do this question and give our final thoughts. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, when comparing like subjective perfusion assessment under white light with uh, uh, objective, um, find more um, with uh, fluorescence angiography, um, oftentimes, 
uh, these leaks tend to develop in a more delayed fashion around post-op day three to five, um, as uh, you don't necessarily have a, a, a proximal limb of bowel that is objectively has zero perfusion. Those would tend to present themselves, I think, more early in the operating room. But uh, you know, oftentimes these are hypoperfused, poorly perfused segments that over time as a result of inadequate perfusion tend to leak again around that post-update post update three to five uh, period. Yeah, I can piggyback on that. I think that the, certainly there are uh, a good number of anastomoses that develop some degree of ischemia um, in the post-operative period, so not at the time you're actually creating the anastomosis. And there are other factors that are involved in that, obviously tension on the anastomosis and things of that nature. Um, I do think, you know, as Dr. Morris uh, pointed out, especially with this the Pillar 2 trial, that Jafari study that he pointed out from 2015, um, that showed that, you know, despite, I think we all think we're pretty good at what we do, but you know, they were, these were all really prominent colorectal surgeons involved in that study, multi-institutional study, and they were just flat out wrong about perfusion almost 10% of the time. So yeah, I think this is something that while not perfect and, and certainly doesn't eliminate anastomotic leaks, uh, I do think it's going to eliminate some of those early post-operative anastomotic leaks that that are just due to, to our misjudgment or perfusion of the actual uh, uh, portion of the colon and or rectum that we're, we're using for that anastomosis. So I do think it's absolutely useful. It's not going to eliminate leaks, of course. Yeah, I just about under that, my understanding, and please, any colorectal surgeons on like you, Dr. Bennett, correct me if I'm wrong, but if there's a leak intraoperatively that you detect with an, with an air test or with a or, or with a, a, a beta line test or whatever, that's a technical error. That's not ischemia. That That's an incomplete staple line. Ischemia doesn't happen that fast. If you have a leak three to three to five days later, that's an ischemic leak. But if you have a leak on the table, that's not a ischemic leak, that's a technical error. And then just, just uh, another thing I'm gonna bring up now so I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that p-value either is significant or it isn't. So if you have a super low p-value, that's not more significant than if it's just 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. Um, so just don't be impressed by a really low p-value. It's either significant or it isn't. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a common mistake people make. They they think, oh, wow, this is there's a lot of zeros before that five or the one in the p-value. So that's better than just 0.05. I agree with you there. Yeah, I think to, to go back to your comment, um, the if you if you perform an anastomosis with malperfused tissue, it's it oftentimes it might not leak right in front of you. You may have a negative leak test in the operating room, and that's going to reassure you you're going to leave the operating room uh, thinking that everything is fine. Well, we know that even in the best of circumstances, even with good perfusion. So there's a great study by uh, the group up at the Leahy Clinic in Massachusetts looking at colorectal anastomosis. If you have two intact uh, donuts from your EDA stapler, you have good perfusion by ICG and a negative intraoperative leak test by doing a flexible sigmoidoscopy, you still have about a 4% leak rate. So you're not going to eliminate everything. I think you're going to eliminate those blatantly, um, you know, I, I would consider a misjudgment or perfusion a technical error as well, but it's not probably not going to show up until your post-op day three to five, probably closer to three if you just have grossly ischemic tissue you're using as the anastomosis. Excellent. Dr. Morris, you want to just sum us up and then take us out, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, in general, I've discussed three primary applications of ICG here, but I've provided a list here that is by no means exhaustive to demonstrate that there are a variety of different applications for this very, very uh, uh, versatile technology. Um, you know, as this technology evolves, I do suspect that there will be improvement with regards to some of the technical limitations that we've discussed here. Uh, and regardless, I strongly believe that ICG is a very phenomenal technology, uh, one which I've become a strong advocate for and hope to continue to incorporate in my practice as I move into my uh, attending practice this September. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. I really appreciate your time. Uh, here are some of my references, and I'm happy to answer any last questions that folks may have. Excellent. And thank you, Dr. Bennett, again, for being our moderator extraordinaire. Definitely a great talk and a timely topic for all of us. Um, so we do not have Grand Rounds next month. We're skipping until June, but I hope we'll see everyone there. If everyone wouldn't mind, just put it on your cameras uh, for a moment so I can take our picture for Twitter. Um, that would be great.
Dr. Benzi, can we take it off and put it on, um, stop share screen so we can see Oh, it. yes. Sorry, Dylan, do you mind yes. unsharing your screen? And I just want to ask an excellent job, Dr. Morris. 